that surprised me, but don't get me started on gender. That's another topic. Okay. Women are often not perceived as authorities. So that's an important variable. Titles. If you stick doctor or professor before your name, a lot of people will be real impressed with that and afraid to question you. Now, I hope you're all willing to question your professors, politely, of course. Rudeness, we don't like rudeness. You can't do that. But you should be willing to, to question. OK. Even the arrangement of furniture can make a difference. Does that surprise you? No. There was a study done in a discipline that sort of faded out now, but I actually taught it once, environmental psychology. And what they found, actually since we have a chalkboard, I'll illustrate it. Let's say you're going to visit the professor. Here's a door, here's a chair, here's a professor. Now a lot of professors don't do this. This puts the professor in a power up position and you in a power down because you've got the desk between you and the professor or the doctor or whatever it might be. But you walk in, professor sitting here, you sit here, then you're more like equals. And that's based on studies, not that's what they actually found. So that's, uh, I think that's very interesting. If you're aware of that and you come to an authority or an expert situation where the furniture is arranged like that, you know, just say, I'm not going to be cowed by that, right? Yeah. Body language also makes a difference. Don't slump over when you're talking to authority, you know, go like this. Sit up straight. Watch out for clues that you're nervous or tense. Don't draw your body in like that with the arms closed, shoulders forward. No, you have to sit up straight and have your arms on the chair, not in your lap. Steady eye contact. Don't keep looking down. All of these are based on psychology research uh, on nonverbal communication. Another factor, watch your language, <laughs> and I don't mean don't swear at the professor. That really is not good. Language can communicate either power or weakness. So don't mumble. You put energy into your voice without over-dramatizing your concern. Don't talk too softly, OK? A soft tone or a flat tone makes you sound weak. And you then, then you're in a power down position. Another Situa another thing that people do, and especially women, but not just women, tag questions that turn statements into questions. This is a good plan, isn't it? Now, or a rising inflection at the end of a sentence that when the other person can perceive as lack of confidence. And I, I never do do that, so it's hard for me to replicate. I have to concentrate real hard, make sure it's clear what I mean. See what I just did? I, I did a rising inflection at the end of a sentence. Women do this more than men. Don't do it, okay? Because it will be perceived by men as weakness. Even, that's, even though that's not what it is. Uh, with women, the, the tag question, this is a good plan, isn't it? is not lack of self-confidence, but trying to include other people in the discussion. It, ha it has a different motive than men think it does. So again, this is all based on research, so you've got to watch out for that. Another uh, behavior that puts you in a power down position is letting others interrupt you. And research has shown that men are more likely to interrupt women than the other way around. Any of you women surprised at that? Okay. And, and not intentionally, it's, men don't realize they're doing it. And women have been trained to be more cooperative, to be, and wait their turn. 
in a business discussion, you can't wait your turn. So if someone interrupts you, you have to say something like, I know you have some important points to make, but I need to state my case too. Please let me finish what I'm saying. You have to be willing to do that, otherwise in certain sorts of situations, they'll walk all over you. Another thing that you have to watch out for, and again, this is more true of women than men, but it's also a cultural thing. In certain, in the South or in uh, Asian cultures, even men are trained to be perhaps more polite than, let's say, someone from New York City. Don't be indiscriminately polite. Many people have been taught that it's rude to be assertive or that it's not nice to talk back to authority figures. But stop and think about it. If um, you're asking questions, is that, or standing up for yourself, is that being rude? No. So if someone is rude to you or trying to harm you, you're not obligated to be polite. Why should you? Remember, the point is not to convince them that you're nice, but to get the information you need. I once had a French teacher back in high school who said something I've never forgotten. She said, I'd rather be called a damn fool than nice. Now, I didn't totally understand what she meant at the time, but I had a sense, and since then, I totally understand. If you're nicey nice and different, people will walk all over you. And so being called nice is often not really a compliment. Depends on the context. I'm not against niceness. I'd sure like to see a lot more of it out on the freeways. Huh? <laughs> but indiscriminate politeness, when it's not appropriate, will not help you. Something that kind of goes along with that, and again, is more characteristic of women, but sometimes men can do it, apologizing when it's neither necessary nor appropriate. I had a student once who was like this. She was a very, uh, was an older student, and she was very smart. She, she ended up making an A in my class. But she would apologize for coming to my office hours. Uh, oh, come on, you know. <laughs> I said, no, no, you don't need to apologize. My office hours are for you. That's the purpose. They're not for me, they're for you. So I was trying to break her of that habit because it will make you look very weak when you do that. So, and again, that is partly a cultural thing too. Now, it isn't just women, probably more characteristic of women. And so if somebody's being, particularly if somebody's being boorish or condescending, you are not obligated to be nice to them. They're the ones that are rude. They step over the line of civil behavior, they're no longer immediately entitled to polite behavior. And, it, and that actually is relevant for libertarians, because I see a lot of boorish behavior on Facebook. You know what I'm talking about. How many of you are on Facebook? Send me a friend invite. Say, <laughs> I told you to, to, to send you one. I send you one. At any rate, you, so you all know what I'm talking about. Well, if somebody's rude to me, I tell them off. I have, uh, you know, the, one of the great things about getting older is you don't care. <laughs> <laughs> People don't like you to them, you know? Dr. Presley, are you on Twitter or YouTube? Uh, I'm not on Twitter. I hate Twitter. I'm sorry. I just, you, you know, I got to draw a line somewhere. I'm a very busy person. I am on, I am on Facebook. There are two videos of me on YouTube. One is the uh, talk that I gave in September for the student group at Cal. And then there's another one done oh, uh, back about 04. And I look awful, so I hate that video. But the content is good. What? 2009, uh, Max Kessler. Uh, you were interviewed. Uh, Not by Max Kessler. That name is Rui Bell. I, was, I can't remember the fellow's name. I was just looking at it. Oh, OK. Well, if you say so. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, there's a couple of things on YouTube. I, I guess I have to start. I, but a YouTube channel, no. Pardon? Your own YouTube channel, no. I don't know, not under my real name, and I'm not going to tell you what the other one is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I have to start one. But see, I was just waiting until I had some videos. Now, uh, there are a couple of videos, so now I can. 
and so uh, I can be even more um, assertive, shall we say. But uh, if you look on the Libertopia blog, you will see somebody who said some things that I didn't think were appropriate. He used some sexist terms, and I told him off in a very polite academic way. <laughs> and his response was to get real snotty with me. But, um, you know, I think he came out the worst for wear with that argument. Okay. Let's see, we're, okay, we're uh, on to the next point. Take time to think. In certain sorts of situations, it's often the case that maybe the expert will use some kind of high pressure technique. Salespeople, of course, do this. You, if you're in some kind of situation along those lines, you're not sure of what your response would be. Ask for time to think about it. Sometimes even just taking a few minutes to think about the expert's um, uh, point of view. Uh, because see, what happens is the, the expert has power and presence in the immediate situation. If you take time to think about it, it can give you the mental and emotional space you need to think clearly. Um, you might even have a set of standard phrases prepared that you can use when necessary. For example, your suggestion is interesting. Let me think it over and get back to you. Of course, they won't like that, but you have to stand the ground. The next point, look for bias. Think about whether vested interests, closed-minded points of view, stereotyping, or prejudice are pre present in the encounter with the expert in authority. And that will help you not fall for whatever they're pushing. Uh, one woman uh, had a plumber come in, and she's a reasonably attractive uh, uh, woman, middle-aged woman, and the plumber started getting just a little too friendly. And then, then he decided, to, then when he told her what the bill would be uh, for the, uh, the estimate, it was like way high. But she didn't like his manner. So she said, I think, I'm, I think I'll pass on this. And then she talked to her father, and he got somebody to do it for a lot less than that estimate. So there are many way, things you have to watch out for if you think bias might be present. Don't fall for it. So, and especially, you have to watch out for stereotyping. And by, there are many kinds of stereotypes. Race is only one. There are stereotypes about young people, stereotypes about old people. You have to watch out for that sort of thing, too. Okay, let me see. Uh, so what you need to do, if you think that you might be going in a situation where there might be bias against you, in your case, because you're young, and students, be a, you might want to um, be careful of how you dress, be courteous, Speak clearly and calmly, be well prepared, ask intelligent questions, that will help you. Um, let me give you an example, another example here. I had a student who was a black woman in her early 30s, and she had a couple of young kids. And usually when she would take the kids to the doctor at an HMO, possibly Kaiser, uh, Kaiser mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, not one of the better HMOs, in my opinion. She would, she would often uh, be like ta maybe taking them in on Saturday or something, she'd come in with her sweatpants. But this time she had to take her kid into the doctor and she had to come straight from work so she was wearing a business suit. And she said she was amazed at how much better she got treated. The doctor took a whole hour with her instead of going, you know, in the door, out the door. Because, because what she had going against her, let's be honest here, she was black. When she came in dressed in her business suit, she looked like the professional that she actually was, and she had treated better. So all those kinds of things make a difference. Another thing that might be important in certain situations is to bring back up. If you're, uh, for instance, uh, going to a doctor about a troublesome condition or maybe going to a lawyer about a, a troublesome legal situation, 
emotion or over involvement can make it hard for you to be composed or objective. If you're seeking advice about a complicated or emotionally charged issue, bring a friend or relative along as backup. And so that the, the friend or relative can help you and talk to the, the doctor or whoever it might be. And that will make the situation less intimidating also. Or if you're buying, let's say, uh, some a computer or some technical equipment, bring along somebody who's more knowledgeable. This is, of course, especially important for women because if you uh, go to an auto mechanic you don't know, watch out. Because I've had this happen to me. Somebody tried to con me, and I knew it didn't sound right, so I just left and went to somebody else, and what do you know? I was right. God, first guy was trying to con me. So you've got to watch out for that. Bring somebody who's more of an expert than you. It's a very complex situation. Business makes frequent use of consultants. You can too. Okay, another point. Check for options. If the problem is serious or expensive, you may want to ask for advice from another expert. The second opinion is the standard feature of modern medical practice. Why not extend it to other kinds of expert advice? Let, uh, let uh, them act as your consultants you, instead of just going one, you go to several consultants. Look for alternative sources of information. If you have physical symptoms that physicians can't alleviate, explore the non-medical alternatives. The net internet is often the most effective way to shop for op uh, options, but of course you have to be careful when you use critical thinking, because some of the options are like, do, 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 do. You know, it's twilight time, so in time. Um, also, and the final uh, general point here is, here is ask who else can help. Don't assume that the expert you're dealing with is the only one who can solve the problem. That's a little bit related to the previous point. They go together. The authority you're currently dealing with uh, can't help you or is seriously upsetting you. Find somebody else who's willing to help. If it's a low-level clerk or a bureaucrat who tells you that he or she can't help you, ask for the supervisor. By the way, I have a whole chapter on customer reps and how to deal with them. And the most important single thing that I mention is they don't give you what you want, ask for the supervisor. Because the low level people have very little decision making power. You go further up the chain of command, they have more power to, to bend the rules. Okay, these are some of uh, the specifics. How are we doing on time? Um, Okay, since I mentioned customer rep, let me talk just a little bit more specifically about that. I've, I've mentioned several things for physicians, so I'm going to skip to customer rep. When you're talking uh, to a customer rep, on, usually on the phone, of course, write down the date and time. You should have a phone log. I have a spiral notebook that I keep by my phone. Every conversation I have, other than with my friends, I write down what goes on. Because then if something goes wrong, you have some notes there say, well, I talked to Sue on um, September 3rd, and she said, blah, 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 okay? That is, you'll get a lot further with that. So if you're dealing with a customer rep, you write down the date and the rep's name. You know, uh, be succinct, tell them exactly what you want. Don't ramble around. A lot of people do that. Be polite. Ask for the supervisor. If you're writing about a complaint, you have to have copies of the receipts. You send those. What about professionals? Many of these general principles carry over uh, from one professional service to another, whether it's accountant, or plumber, contractor, lawyer. Now, maybe you haven't had much experience with these kinds of uh, services yet. You will. At least I hope so, because what is the alternative? You live in a cave or you're dead. You're going to encounter these. Here is a list that works across many of these kinds of uh, services. 
Know what you want ahead of time. Think things through. Don't just kind of make it up as you go along. Uh, ask for references. Now, we all know that, but we don't always do it. Talk to, if it's a, if it's an expensive project that you might be dealing with somehow in the future, add, talk to previous customers, check for credentials or licenses. Okay, libertarians aren't always crazy about licenses, but there's a lot of horror stories about scams of people who didn't have licenses. Um, but at least ask for credentials so you know that they actually know something about whatever the area is. Get a written contract. Make sure you understand the contract. Get a second opinion. Don't be afraid to ask questions and demand answers. Expect res respectful treatment from the prof professional, even if you don't get And if you don't get it, go elsewhere. Keep informed. Consider alternative options. All of those that can work with many different situations. I guess I should have had something here specifically about how to talk with a professor. You have to come in with as much written documentation as you can. Be very specific. Be very polite. If you don't like the grade you gave, that the professor gave you, you have to uh, ask, try to find out exactly why you got the grade you did. Because sometimes, now I've had students come to me and do that, and once in a while I, I see that they, uh, in some essay question that they wrote, they weren't real clear. Writing is not necessarily a skill that all students have, the writing clearly. If I think they really understood more than, than what I see on the piece of paper, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, and I would give them a few more points in the exam. So you, you have to come in with very specific reasonable points and not just come in whining, I, oh, your grade was unfair. And that really doesn't impress any professor, you know, but if you can be very specific, that sort of thing. And I won't even get into sexual harassment, although if you want to ask about that, I can tell you a funny story about that. Now, uh, the last example I'm going to use before I open it up for questions, the police. The, how many of you, there are a number of videos that are starting to make the rounds of how to do with the police. Anybody seen those? ACLU, absolutely. Yeah. Great videos. Yeah, there's, there's a, a number of them circulating. If you're a, a, a witness, even then, don't blay out of the way. Okay, think carefully about what you say. Because what you say can and will be used against you if they can make it work. Do not assume the police are your friend. Of course, I don't have to say that to libertarians, do I? Okay, be careful what you say. If you think you might be a suspect, tell them as little as possible. Do not babble away. Do not talk to the police. If you have any reason to think you might be a suspect, say, I have nothing to say until I talk to my lawyer. Now, some people are afraid to say that because it's going to make them look guilty. Don't, don't fall for that. Do not talk to the police. Um, and in case, and here, uh, uh, how many of you are familiar with NOLO Press? It's a wonderful resource for self, legal self-help. They must put out several dozen books, everything from how to start a, a nonprofit organization to how to be your own lawyer, okay? It's a wonderful resource. I'm going to quote here. If you're being questioned by the police in any way, that might suspect your uh, suspect. Shut up. Quote, prosecutors can be counted on to use your words against you, uh, write attorneys Bergman and Bergman Barrett in their criminal law handbook. Quote, even a seemingly innocuous explanation may appear to link you to a crime when your words are recounted by a police officer. Unquote. You are not legally obligated to answer any police questions no matter what they claim, you have the right to refuse to answer. And there may be a couple of situations where that is not true, but generally it's true. And that's yeah. not entirely true. You are obligated to identify yourself. Yeah, that's right. Uh, no, that's, uh, I, I was just about to say that. The one thing you do have to identify yourself, you'll be in big trouble. But you don't have to tell them anything more. 
because, he, you know, by the way, I've taught forensic psychology. Wow, what an eye-opener that is. Because the police deliberately don't read you your Miranda rights until they get you down to the station because they hope you will blab something in the meantime because anything you say before you read your rights can and will be used against you. Okay. Do not, other than having to identify yourself, you don't have to answer anything. Don't let them intimidate you into believing otherwise. Uh, re instead, remind them that you have a right to have an attorney present and then call one immediately. If they try to tell you that you don't need an attorney and, and unless you're arrested, don't believe them. Sometimes, uh, well, I, I said, sometimes they wait to officially arrest you, hoping you that you'll blab something before you, you do. So don't do, you know, don't fall for it. And contrary to what you've seen on TV, the police are not obligated to read you a Miranda warning unless you are in custody and they intend to officially interrogate you. Again, they don't have to read you the Miranda rights out on the street. Forget that. <clears throat> Let me give you a real life example. It's um, Elizabeth Loftus is a uh, cognitive psychologist who is an expert on eyewitness testimony. And she has written uh, one book called Eyewitness, I believe is the name of it, um, which is for the general public. And she gives an example of this fellow who happened to be in the vicinity of a crime was committed, and unbeknownst to him, he fitted the description in a general way, although he's totally innocent. And he knew he was innocent, so he bab babbled away. And they used the information about, they, he actually got convicted of the crime, which I believe was murder. It took him two years to clear himself. But it basically ruined his life in this very sad example. No, do not do it. Now, one last point I want to make about that has to do with the police. You all know about the lie detector or polygraph. Do you know how inaccurate it is? Let me tell you about that. If you're under suspicion for the crime and the police ask you to submit to a polygraph test, Unless you are the calmest person in the world, you should say no. Many innocent people fail the polygraph test because they are understandably upset about being questioned for a crime they didn't commit. In fact, some psych psychologists have done a study, and you know, do you, you all know the term false positive? 45% mm -hmm. false positive in the two studies that were done. Do not assume you'll pass a polygraph test because you are innocent. Not in the game. Yeah. And they only do it because they want to intimidate you. They can't even use it in a court of law in most cases. They do it because they want to intimidate you. Don't fall for it. Um, by the way, the rate of false negatives was 20%. So the sociopaths, psychopaths, <laughs> pass the test. It's really a pretty worthless test. Police swear it's not, they're wrong. The science, the studies show otherwise. In fact, there's a book that I often recommend called The Tremor in the Blood by David Lycan. He was the leading expert on the polygraph test. If you have any doubts, read that book. However, you can beat a, a lie detector test should you want to. I would recommend staying away from it. But here, I, I used to tell my students just an offhand way, that one way to do it, if you have a rock in your shoe. When, do you know how polygraph works? They test you with a baseline when you're supposedly calm. And they ask you to deliberately, one of the ways it works is to deliberately lie and so they see what how uh, your blood pressure and so forth is affected by lying. And then they ask you real questions. Well, one th this is a very simple way. I'm going to tell you a better way. Put a rock in your shoe when you do the baseline questions. And you press on, the, on your toe on the rock in your shoe. And then we'll make your blood pressure and the other uh, measures go up. And then when they ask you the real questions, 
you don't press the steel foot your toe in the rocking shoe. Okay, that's a simple way, and it's hard, far from foolproof. But here, uh, I tell you, go to YouTube, look up Michael Shermer. How many of you know about?